Hi there. Um, thank you so much for joining this psychiatry symposium. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful. It's happening. I'm I'm very grateful for that. I wish we could all be together though. Um, and thank you for tuning in. So today I'm going to give you a talk on interoception and anxiety in autistic adults. We know that the brain and the body are intrinsically and dynamically coupled. So thoughts, feelings, and perceptions are influenced by internal signals from the body. And when we think of senses, we tend to think of uh, vision, hearing, smell, taste and touch. But these are actually classified as extraceptor senses. That is, they tell us something about the outside world. And in contrast, we have proprioception, which is a sense of the condition of your body and space, so knowing where your arm is. And we have interoception, which is the sensing of internal bodily signals, such as your heart. And interoception is formally defined as the process by which the nervous system senses, interprets and integrates signals originating from within the body, providing a moment by moment mapping of the body's internal landscape across conscious and unconscious levels. So lots of the work that I do um, with people at Sussex, so Hugo, Lisa and um, James and another of the people in the lab is to investigate different dimensions of interoception. So we can look at the afferent signal in the brain, um, uh, so how heart uh, signals, for example, are sensed by neural processing. We can look at the preconscious impact of body based signals such as the heart and see how they can change the way that stimuli are processed. We can look at individual differences in interceptive accuracy, so how accurately you can detect signals in the body, such as heartbeats, and then um, subjective and higher order uh, measures as well. How good you think you are at interception, metacognitive insight, and attribution of, of bodily signals. And we can investigate interception in a number of different ways. So, First of all, to address this accuracy dimension, we can bring people into the lab and see how accurate they are detecting when their heart is beating. And we can do this using very simple tests. So we get people to count their heartbeats in a specified time frame, and then we can see how many heartbeats they report relative to how many they actually had, and that gives that ratio gives a, a measure of their interceptive accuracy. Or we can play tones, and these tones happen each time the heart beats, or they're just time shifted off the heartbeats, and we can see how accurately people can make synchronicity judgments. And what's been known for a long time now is that the, this interceptive accuracy measure um, has implications for how people process emotion. So in this particular study, they did this interceptive accuracy um, paradigm on people, and the people, the bars here, which are in black, are those individuals who are very good at this heartbeat detection task. The white bar are the people that really struggled and were very poor, um, had poor accuracy of the heartbeat perception tasks. And then they got people to look at different films designed to elicit amusement, anger or fear. And then they asked people to rate how intense they found these films. And they found that those individuals with higher interceptive accuracy rated the films as more intense. And this is consistent with the idea that emotional feeling states arise from the sensing of internal bodily signals. So the more accurate you are at detecting heart changes, the more intense you feel emotions. And work using fMRI neuroscience methods have investigated the neural systems underlying the sensing of internal bodily sensations. So these interceptive accuracy paradigms were um, repeated in the scanner um, and they found that this particular area in the right anterior insula, the degree to which this was active correlated with how accurately people could detect their heart and also the grey matter volume of this area also predicted how accurately people could detect their heart. So now a functional measure and a structural measure in the same region correlates with individual differences in interceptive accuracy. And work by other labs has investigated um, how interoception may map onto emotion in the brain. And in these paradigms, they've got people to both do these interoception tasks where they focus on the body, and they did emotion tasks where they got people to focus or feel different emotions. And then they did a conjunction analysis to see where there was shared activation during both interoception and emotion processing. And they found that the insula was a particular area that was involved in both um, interoception and emotion. 
giving rise to this idea that the int that the insular is key for the sensing of internal bodily sensations as a means to inform emotional experience. And understanding the interception and the potential for this to inform emotion has potential relevance when we're trying to understand different conditions that may have alterations in emotion processing. So a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment and other people in the lab are investigating is um, autism spectrum conditions. And autism is a neurodevelopmental condition where individuals um, can display alterations in understanding their own emotions and the emotions of others. But rather than just give you a textbook definition of what autism is, um, a wonderful postdoc in the lab, Lisa, um, got onto Twitter with the hashtag actually autistic to say that we're going to be defining autistic individuals to the scientific community and what um, definition would you give yourself? Like, What does autism mean to you and what definition can we give to share with the scientific community during our talks? And this is one of the ones um, that was given. So autism is a pervasive and inherent part of my brain and body. Autism is the way I process information. It is my deep sensory interaction of the world. It is a joyous stimming. So here, this individual actually highlighted the sensory aspects of autism as key. And um, autism is very, very highly comorbid with anxiety. Estimates range from 23 to 60% of autistic um, individuals also have an anxiety disorder. And then from a brain perspective, um, looking at this area of the insula, which is this area involved both in interoception and emotion processing, this area seems quite altered in autistic individuals. Sometimes it's more active, sometimes it's less active, but strikingly it's connectivity, so the degree to which it co-activates with other areas in the brain seems to be reduced. So it's acting more like an island in autistic individuals. And um, the reduced insular connectivity is seen particularly in regard to connections to the somatosensory cortex in autistic individuals. And so to see whether potentially one of the mechanisms that's giving rise to impaired emotion processing, altered emotion processing, could see whether it's um, as a basis in interception, we administered the first ever ever interception paradigms in autistic adults where we again use these very straightforward cardiac perception tests and we were able to show that autistic adults had impaired interceptive accuracy so here are neurotypical control individuals each one is a black circle and aut autistic individuals are a red circle and you can see that while there was an impairment at the group level not everyone who was autistic was impaired some were just as good as neurotypicals at interceptive accuracy and then some individuals really found this very hard and were very impaired in their capacity to be accurate um, and then this contrasted to the self-report measures so when we gave people a scale to see how good or how aware they were of their internal bodily sensations. Uh, neurotypical controls in general would say not very aware, whereas autistic individuals were like, oh, very aware. So they were actually much more heightened in this awareness measure. And it wasn't just that the two corresponded together, that those were high in, high in accuracy, also high, had high awareness. There was actually no correlation between these two measures. So it seems like the, the interceptive profile and autistic individuals was that some individuals had impaired accuracy um, and this was coupled with a tendency for individuals to have to report greater awareness about bodily signals. The impaired interceptive accuracy in autistic individuals was then replicated in a, um, a, in a group aged 6 to 18, so a child and adolescent sample. And actually in this younger sample, the interceptive reduction in accuracy was actually greater than the one we found, um, showing that this effect is, can be replicated, but also that it manifests young as well. Um, and then coming back to our data, when we z-scored these values to put them in standardized space and then subtracted them, so we could see how aware people thought they were at interception relative to their actual accuracy, and then have an error score, that uh, a tendency to have 
to report greater awareness relative to actual accuracy was associated with greater anxiety. So this, intercept, this higher interoceptive error score correlated with more anxiety symptoms. Um, so interoceptive accuracy is very linked to autonomic control and that good accuracy into what your body is doing can potentially allow you to regulate it. And we wondered whether we could train individuals to be more interoceptively accurate, whether we could see reductions in anxiety. This initial pilot happened in non-autistic individuals and um, we tested their anxiety at the beginning and end and we also tested their interoceptive accuracy at base line and midpoint in the final assessment and then four training sessions happened either side of the midpoint assessment to make eight training sessions in total and during these training sessions individuals did mild exercise such as star jumps to increase the um, cardiac signal so their heart beat stronger and faster and then they got extra receptive feedback from the experimenter telling them whether they were accurate or inaccurate when they were doing these tests and this as well their cardiac signal returned back down to baseline and we were able to show that these training trials coupling interoceptive and extraceptive feedback was able to make people significantly more accurate over time to show you those graphs quickly that um, looking at interoceptive training both using this tracking or counting paradigm and using the discrimination one with tones of plate in sync or out of sync there was increased interoceptive accuracy in the group that received interoceptive and extraceptive training relative to a control group that did not receive training. In addition, anxiety was decreased in the interceptor training group. This was significant at the group level for trait anxiety, and while there was a reduction in state anxiety, the group level wasn't significant. Some people had really big drops and other people had less big drops, but there were no significant drops in anxiety in the control condition. And what was interesting is both state and trait anxiety, the reductions in them were specifically coupled to increases in interoceptive accuracy. So um, those individuals who had the greatest increase in accuracy had the biggest drop in state and trait anxiety. And we've now taken this interceptor training protocol into an autistic sample in 120 individuals. Um, this has been a massive undertaking and it would not have happened without Hugo's original idea and the incredible work by Lisa and James who have really um, worked so hard to get this done. And in this, um, in this experiment, we had 120 autistic individuals um, some of them had a brain scan before interceptor training and a brain scan after, so we could look at changes in insular connectivity and activation. And then we monitored their anxiety and their emotion pre-post training. And we compared this interceptive training um, group to an extraceptive training group who are also autistic, and their extraceptive training was an emotional prosody um, uh, training. So they heard sentences said in emotional ways, so like a happy way or a sad way. And then we tr looked at their changes in anxiety and emotion afterwards. And I'm really excited to present you what I think is the first ever outing of the results from this clinical trial. It's just a teaser, just to give you some sort of highlights. We're actually currently analysing the data right now, but Lisa very kindly put together these um, graphs to give you sort of a first snapshot of these findings. We found that interoceptive accuracy score was significantly greater using both the simple tracking paradigm and the more hard discrimination synchronicity paradigm um, relative to the prosody group. And that we also get significant drops in um, trait anxiety uh, relative to in the interception group relative to the prosody group. Um, and while we got more drops in state anxiety in the interceptin group relative to the prosody group, the state effect did not meet um, group level significance. So this actually replicates the findings from our pilot. Um, and the, the increase in interceptive accuracy was correlated with a reduction in anxiety. So the more people increased the interceptive accuracy, the more they drop in anxiety. And to give you some also some testimonials, um, people discussed 
a reduction of, so what Lisa did was she interviewed some autistic individuals who'd undergone the training to get them to say what it was like for them. And I'm just gonna read you out a um, some of these now. So one individual said, as the in, inner channel gets clearer, the outer channel gets more quiet. And I think this potentially speaks to um, hypersensitivity to extraceptive senses in autistic individuals. So sometimes they can feel very overwhelmed by bright lights and loud noises. And this suggests that sensory processing may be a bit like a seesaw. So if you can increase the clarity of the interceptive channel, then you can maybe dull the um, dominance of the extraceptive channel. Another individual said, when I notice the impacts of anxiety in my body, I'm more aware of them and I'm able to reassure myself that it's just a physical reaction. I'm better at taking deep breaths and trying to slow my breathing and heart rate down rather than letting it spiral. So this speaks to how having early access into bodily signals can help individuals regulate um, what their body's doing. Uh, and this can potentially be more beneficial if people have early access into the ramping up of their heart relative to if they're already in a state of sort of a panic attack where it'd be much harder to regulate at that point. And then finally, one individual said, I believe it's increased my awareness of hunger. And as a result, I remember to eat, drink and go to the toilet. And this is really important because there's a big debate in the interceptive literature right now about the degree to which interception is generalizable across different bodily axes. And this particular individual seems to suggest that having training in the cardiac domain potentially had beneficial influences on other domain, such as gastric, knowing when you're hungry and, and um, knowing when you need to go to the bathroom. So to conclude, interception is the sensing of internal bodily sensations. Influence, um, interception can influence emotion. So um, those individuals who have better interceptive accuracy can maybe experience emotion with more intensity and interceptive error is related to anxiety and um, our work has shown that interceptive accuracy is reduced in some autistic individuals and that interceptive training seems to reduce anxiety and we've shown that both in a control group and also now replicated in an autistic group and it really highlights um, behavioural interceptive based interventions could be a promising new treatment for things like anxiety. Um, uh, and then finally, I'd like to thank people. So first of all, I'd like to thank Hugo Critchley, who um, is head of department and is just so wonderful um, to work with. Um, I'm hugely grateful for his mentorship and for everything he's done for my career and the career of so many other people. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the lab who, I mean, we couldn't do this work without them. Um, uh, so thank you to them. And I'd particularly like to highlight Lisa and James, who were really the driving force for this autism trial where they've done all the testing and it's been enormous amounts of work and they're now working hard on the analysis. And finally, MQ, I'd like to particularly highlight in terms of funding as they funded this um, clinical trial. And I'd like to thank you all for watching. Um, thanks very much. Bye.